Hi everyone, thanks so much for tuning in to today's workshop. Um, we will be uh, doing a beautiful class today called Summer Cool Down, and it is a spin on cool tones of flowers that are seasonal and beautiful for this time of year. Um, the inspiration, of course, was that we are all dying from the heat, and even though the colors of August tend to be more of the really vibrant reds and corals and pinks, um, there is something to be said for just fresh, cool whites, lavenders, purples, and blues. Um, so we're going to explore that color family. Uh, everyone who is taking class today should have received a couple of things. So the first thing that you will have is a paper bag. Um, you've got a five inch white cylinder base. Uh, you should have chicken wire, which is tough to see, but this is chicken wire. Uh, and then also a beautiful bucket of flowers. So uh, there is also an ingredient list tucked in if you wanna follow along with the exact quantities of stems that we'll be using. Um, and to prepare for class, everyone needs to fill their base with a little bit of water. We always recommend when we're handling flowers, and this is one of those things to remember if you are first time to workshop, uh, to use a room temperature water. And the reason for that is all of your flowers are very sensitive to temperatures. So if you stick your flowers in really freezing water, they will get angry, it's very shocking to them. Um, and then on the flip side, if you put your flowers in really hot water, it actually causes them to open more quickly, which is a good hack if you're ever designing for an event and want your roses to really explode open quickly, you can use warm water. Um, but for us today, we want to enjoy our flowers for the long haul, so we want to get them just room temperature water. Um, and once you've done that, you will want to add a little bit of chicken wire to the inside of your vase. Um, if this is your first time, you may be a little perplexed as to why we're using chicken wire. It is definitely a weird tool. It's something you might expect to see on a farm and not in a flower shop. Uh, but chicken wire is a great little trick to give structure to the center of your vase. And anyone who's tried to design at home kind of amateur flowers, you may have gotten frustrated because your flowers without an armature or structure will kind of flop and do their own thing. Um, so this is a great way to kind of lock your stems in place and build beautiful shape with your design. Um, another little hack, if you don't have chicken wire laying around and you're in a pinch, you can definitely use the scotch tape trick, which is great, and that's just creating a lattice over the mouth of your vase. Um, or you could use floral foam or a frog, so there's plenty of other options. Uh, but chicken wire is our preferred and um, little structure armature for the inside of our vase. And I'm just kind of rolling it into a ball, okay? Nothing fancy, does not need to look pretty. And I'm just gonna pop it down inside my vase. And it sits right below the top of the vase. I can still run my hand over the top. Uh, and once I've done that, once I've got my water and my chicken wire, I'm really ready to roll. Um, you are going to need some type of cutting tool for class. And I'll show you the two tools that I always have on my station. Um, the first tool that I use is a knife. It's a Swiss Army knife, and um, if you are a little bit more seasoned and practiced, you may want to try playing with a knife, but if you are clumsy and accident prone, maybe not for you. Um, but the, the basic staple of every floral designer is a good pair of clippers. Uh, this is a Japanese pair of clippers. They're linked in our Amazon shop. If you go to our uh, Instagram profile and click link in bio, you can find both of these. Um, if you are designing at home tonight with scissors, that's fine as a one-time thing, but you always want to be using a floral clipper or knife. They're just a uh, gauge to cut your stems without damaging the vessels at the bottom of your stems that drape for the flower. So um, these are definitely preferred. So uh, to get started, at Helen and Olivia when we design, we have a normal routine way that we like to design, and it always involves using hydrangea as a base first. So everyone has three baby green hydrangea in their bucket, and they are full buckets, so if you don't see them at first, just kind of shimmy around, you'll find them. Um, and they're in little plastic sleeves. So we're gonna go ahead and rip off the sleeves. And each stem uh, will have a couple of leaves um, that are kind of lower line leaves. We're going to peel away any low line leaves that would maybe sit um, in the water if we put the stem in. We'll leave just the topmost leaves that kind of cut the flower and very pretty. Uh, but anything low lying, we're gonna take away. 
You can just rip them off with your hands pretty quickly. So this is another really important point uh, I want everyone to remember, is always remove your leaves from your stems. Anything that sits in this water will eventually start to um, deteriorate, turn to slimy swamp water. So we only want to be putting clean stems. Any leaves, you're going to get that bacteria, green algae, yuck. Um, so very important and really does affect how long your flowers will live. So this is what we're going for. Just maybe one or two tiny leaves right up at the top, the rest of the stem clean. And then we're gonna take our cutting tool, I'm gonna to use a knife, and we're going to cut our stems to length. And so this is a five inch tall vase. We are uh, cutting our stems so that the flower just sits right at the baseline. So your stem should be about five inches in length as well. And we're going to allow our stems to kind of crisscross into the center of the vase. So there's my first hydrangea. It's just sitting on the edge of the vase and I'm gonna space my other two equidistantly. So we'll kind of divide uh, the base into thirds. And this hydrangea, the reason why it's the first ingredient in is because we want coverage. Um, hydrangea is by no means the coolest or sexiest flower that we will design with. It is though cheap and full and pretty. So we're using it to trace out the shape and give some weight to the center of our design. So I'll give a little spin, I'm on a Lazy Susan. You can see they're pretty tightly tucked into the vase. Um, and these hydrangea leaves that we've left on are giving us lots of good coverage. So the goal is we don't want anyone to see our chicken wire. That's like our magic trick on the inside. We just want to cover it up. All right, so we're gonna pause on flowers and play around with some pretty greenery to now further trace out the shape of our design. So anytime we're designing a Helen Olivia, the order of ingredients is always hydrangea first, greenery second, and then all of the flowers. So our next uh, green that we will put in is an umbrella fern. Um, it's named because it looks just like an umbrella. And it's a really beautiful wispy green. And even though it looks really delicate, it is pretty long lasting. So it's nice for that reason. And we're again going to cut the stem down to about that five inch length. And we're gonna tuck the umbrella fern in kind of from the side. We want it to have a little bit of a lean. And don't be afraid to kind of reach in and manipulate your umbrella fern so it sits nicely. So I'll spin it around. My umbrella fern is definitely oriented more to one side. And at some point, you kind of have to let the flowers talk to you and figure out where the umbrella fern looks most beautiful and maneuver around. So I like the way that's sitting. And um, if at any point your umbrella fern feels unruly, you can always do what's called a haircut, meaning go in with your clippers and just cut away the part you don't like. Um, so there's nothing wrong with using three quarters of your umbrella fern and just getting rid of whatever's bugging you. All right, so next up, we're gonna layer in a little bit more greenery and you'll have to dig into your buckets. We're going to use a couple of pieces of green bush ivy. Um, fun fact about bush ivy, well it's part of the ivy family, but this is actually what grows on the side of the highway. So if you've ever seen those huge retaining walls on the side of 495, for example, that have really pretty greens spilling over, that's what this is. Um, it's beautiful, it's really nice and shiny, um, and it's also a great green because you can divide the stems, so you get two or three for the price of one. Um, so I'm going to do just that. I'm going to um, break the stem down into two pieces. As long as the stem length is around five inches long, you are in good shape. Um, and I'm going to do the same thing I did with my hydrangea. I'm just peeling away any of my low-lying leaves that would go into the water. I like to do all of my repetitive work at once, so I'm just cleaning all of my stems of bush ivy, and then I'll work on getting them in a second. So, Oops, I just took my umbrella for an hour, let me tuck that back in. All right, so now I'm gonna go ahead and pop in my bush ivy. And I'm gonna use this to fill in the space in between the hydrangea. Um, and I like to let my bush ivy hang out just a tiny bit farther than the, the hydrangea um, to give it a little bit more of a natural look. But this is a personal taste scenario. So if you are somebody who likes a really natural, free-flowing design. You may want to let your greenery hang out a little bit more. 
And if you are more of a really uh, type A, tightly packed pave type of designer, you may want to tuck it really nicely. Um, so it's up to you. Whatever speaks to you is what you should do. All right, so I've got my bush ivy filled in. I'm going to then uh, reach for my next greenery, which is a beautiful Baptisia foliage. And you can tell just by the way this is kind of bouncing around that it's got pretty movement and drape to it. Um, I call it a little bit floaty. So anytime you've got a floaty green, I like to allow it to kind of hang out a tiny bit more, be a little bit more natural. So um, again, you pick what feels good to you. I'm allowing this Baptisia foliage to kind of sit maybe an inch or two past my hydrangea and I'll spin it around for you as I'm letting these pieces float out a tiny bit. And I'm just being careful as I go to strip away any of the low-lying leaves that would get down into the water, okay? So just peel those right off with your hands. Baptisia is a greenery that's very seasonal, so it's uh, a local green. You cannot buy it or import it from other parts of the world. It's domestic, um, and it's available really only in the summer months as a result. Um, you can buy just the foliage, which is what we have, or you can buy it with flowers, and it has a little pretty blue flower. It's a natural blue flower. Um, so tonight we're just using the greenery. Okay, so just spinning around and making sure I get really good coverage from all angles. And you can see, now that we're really getting through our greenery, that this arrangement could be just green and it looks full and beautiful and lush. So um, you can tell it's gonna be really something when flowers go in. All right, next up, we're going to add our current favorite type of greenery which is a little bit of ligustrum. This is part of the privet plant. And again, we're just gonna be stripping off these leaves and sticking in our ligustrum. This is one of the things that I think makes an arrangement really unique and beautiful. A lot of people say that they're anti-greenery or when they place orders with us, they say, um, you know, not a lot of filler. Um, for us though, you know, as designers, I think we all really appreciate the greenery and think that it's what gives um, a little bit of extra interest to the arrangement. So we're, we're a pro greenery design team for sure. And hopefully you guys are seeing how beautiful of a base it's really going to create. All right, so our final little bit of greenery that we're gonna pop in will be lamb's ear. And this is a favorite of mine this is coming from uh, one of our local farmer friends. This came from uh, Farmer Jen, um, and it's beautiful. It has kind of the feel of Dusty Miller. It's definitely like a soft, fuzzy green leaf, and it's got a silvery green hue to it, so it's a perfect fit for our color scheme tonight. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and just cut my stem and nestle it in my green up. And I like to let it kind of pop out a little bit so you can see it. Um, so that concludes our greening up of this design. We've now got a really beautiful base to layer in our flowers. And so another takeaway, a thing to remember for the next time you design is do not underestimate the importance of your base. So make sure you get structure inside your base, like chicken wire or a tape grid or whatever. Um, and then hydrangea and a substantial amount of greenery is really key to creating beautiful shape and fullness. Um, so for this one little five inch cylinder, we put in four or five different types of greenery. It took a lot of product to achieve just this little bit of fullness. Um, so I think a lot of people underestimate how much they need to buy to create an arrangement. All right, uh, so our next ingredient that we're going to play around with is a flower. Thank God you all paid the price putting in all those greens. Um, so we like to start when we're arranging um, hydrangea greenery and then we go into roses next. And the reason we go into roses next is because they are definitely a focal flower. They're a heavy flower, it's a weight flower, um, and we want to give them priority to popping them in. And then we'll finish with the lighter area flowers that we can kind of layer on top. Um, so our roses tonight are gorgeous. These are Playa Blanca roses, which are by far our favorite white roses. Um, not all whites are created equal, so 
Some whites have a really yellow or green undertone. Other whites have a pink undertone. This is like the truest, uh, it's, it's definitely a warm white, but it's a true white. So it's great for wedding work. Um, and it also is a slow opener. So it lasts and lasts in a vase, which is great. So to condition your roses, um, you wanna go ahead and strip away all of your leaves. So that's the first step. And then the second step with your roses is that you're going to wanna to peel away the guard petals. And the guard petals is what does not look pretty on the outside of the rose. Um, so the guard petal at one point was part of the outside of the rosebud and it's been banged up and bruised um, during transport and just over time. Uh, so we're going to peel those away. Anytime you handle roses, but most importantly for a white rose, you never want to handle the face of the flower because it will bruise. Uh, so you only want to really touch from the side of the rose and you want to make sure that you're peeling the entire petal. And I'm gonna jump the gun and answer a question that someone is probably thinking of right now at home. Um, and that is, uh, how many petals should I be removing? And the, the answer is, there's no right answer. So you wanna just look at each rose um, independently. Some roses you'll need to take off five or six petals. Other roses, it may be just one. Uh, so just take a quick look at your roses uh, and yank off anything that doesn't look great. Okay. So you can see that it is a real chore prepping roses, and that might be a little insight into why wedding flowers are so expensive. Um, imagine, for example, this weekend we have thousands of stems of roses coming into our shop. So we need to do this a thousand times. It's quite time consuming. All right, so I've got my roses cleaned up uh, and I'm gonna look at them. If I feel like I want my rose to be a little bit more open for my design, a nice little trick is to blow on the face of your rose. And this is a flower that actually will respond to the warmth in your breath. Uh, it does not work for other flowers, so you'll just look crazy if you're blowing on your hydrangea, but for roses, it's a good little trick. Um, and then I'm gonna go ahead and cut my stems to that magic five inch length because our vase is five inches tall. And I'm gonna go ahead and gently pocket my roses in. Now, since I have six white roses, I'm gonna actually try to achieve little groupings of my roses. Roses are a flower that like to travel in pairs or in trios. Um, and that gives a little bit more impact to their placement. So I'm gonna do a trio, which will look kind of like a triangle. So I've got one, two, three. Um, and when you do trios, don't feel like they have to be right on top of each other. There can definitely be breathing room between them. So I'm gonna pop in that trio and then I'll do another trio on the back side. And I'm also going to be mindful as I design that I'm kind of putting my stems in at angles that curve and arc all the way up in the top. You definitely don't want to have a flat top. That's something to watch out for. Um, it can look kind of like a failed souffle project if you uh, have a really recessed top. So make sure to give a nice curve. Okay. And I'll give you a little spin. It's starting to come together. Um, and now I'm going to switch over to my beautiful lavender roses. So these are called Ocean Songs. And they're a really beautiful, cool tone of lavender. Um, a lot of the time when we order lavender roses, if you're not careful with the variety, you can wind up with something that's very pink. But this is a great, cool, silvery lavender. And we're gonna do the exact same thing. We're going to um, peel away the leaves and just clean up the guard petals. So we'll take off a couple. However many your rose needs taken off, go ahead and do. And again, if you want to open your rose a bit more, you can blow on it. And then we will pop these in. Now, since we only have three of the Ocean Song, don't worry so much about grouping them. You can just kind of pocket them in wherever there is room. And lavender and white is such a pretty combination together. We really love uh, this pairing. All right, so I've got all of my roses worked in. Um, I am next going to grab for my beautiful blue delphinium. 
Delphinium is one of the few naturally occurring light blue flowers. There are not many of them. Um, and this is just such a pretty shade of sky blue. Uh, this is uh, what's considered a short grade of Delphinium. There is also a much taller grade that is much more expensive, but this is at least within reach for everyday design. Um, and because it's such a linear flower, we can do one of two things. So we can divide the stem into two pieces. Um, so if you wanted to do that, you would cut uh, towards the bottom of the stem and save yourself one little cluster here. And then you can use the top of this delphinium as a separate stem, or you can just strip away the low lying blooms and just use this as one stem. So it's up to you how you'd like to divide up your delphinium, but either way you are gonna have to peel back a little bit of your flower, which is sad, uh, but necessary. It's a necessary evil. And then we're just going to tuck our blue delphinium in. This is definitely a flower that you want to allow to hang out or float a little bit past your roses and hydrangea um, to give your arrangement a bit of an airy feel. So how far it floats is up to you. I'm doing maybe two inches past my arrangement. Um, but again, personal taste and aesthetic. I'll do a little spin for you. So I've got it really evenly spread and divided over the arrangement. The next flower I'm gonna work with is a flower that up until a few months ago, we had pretty much no experience with here at Helen Olivia. On a whim, I decided to order it uh, from a Dutch importer. This is called Phlox. And uh, I'll be honest, it's not a super premium flower, but it is a flower that you're growing to love. Uh, it's very light, very airy and great to kind of fill in an arrangement. Um, there are certain varieties of blocks that are not so pretty, but the white blocks um, has become a favorite of ours. I think it's a beautiful accent and great for summer. All right, so we're going to, again, peel back all of these low-lying leaves and then cut our stems a little bit shorter and just pocket this blocks in. And it's so beautiful and light and it's just a different shape. Um, when you're designing, it's great to always think about balance. So if you're using a lot of heavier blooms like hydrangea and roses, it's really nice to kind of counterbalance that with some lighter area flowers like the phlox. Um, and phlox is another great option for a vase arrangement like this that you would enjoy at home because it opens over time. So when the blooms that are already open expire, you can kind of pick them away and the rest of the buds will open up. So it's a nice, Nice little flower. As you go, don't be afraid to kind of zhuzh, my favorite word, zhuzh. Um, a lot of times the flowers will shift and move around a bit. Like I'm noticing my top rose is kind of sinking down. So uh, don't be afraid to maneuver things around. Um, our next ingredient is an interesting ingredient. Um, it's called Tweedia, and it is again a natural light blue flower. Um, Tweedia, I say, is interesting because it does something that most flowers do not do. So Tweedia, when you go to pull away your leaves, you will notice that your hands may feel a little bit sticky. And that's because Tweedia, like milkweed, puts out a little bit of a white sap. Um, it has a smell to it. It's not, it's not a good smell. It's not a bad smell. But it definitely has a smell. Um, and it's sticky. So just be aware as you go. You're not crazy if you think your hands are feeling a little sticky. Um, we're going to peel away everything low-lying, just leaving the topmost blooms. Um, Tweedia is such a popular flower right now, especially in the wedding world. Uh, the color blue has kind of taken off. We're seeing blue mixed with lots of other colors that we didn't see mixed with before. Like we're doing a lot of weddings that are peaches and blue, for example, or lavender and blue. Uh, and Tweedy Eye is a flower that all of the brides are coming in with pictures of because it's just so pretty. It's a true sky blue color and it's great for bouquets. It's very soft and dainty. So we'll go ahead and pop this in. I don't know about you guys, but I'm feeling cooled off already. This is great. Um, and just a few more ingredients to pop in. You'll notice if you've been kind of paying attention, we started with the big heavy flowers first and towards the end of the design, we're left with really tiny wispy flowers to layer on top and that's very intentional. So uh, we're just 
using some really light flowers to add a little bit of accent to the design. Uh, so the next ingredient that will pop in is clematis. This is a clematis vine in a lavender color. It's a flower that looks pretty delicate, but is actually very long lasting. Uh, so we'll go ahead and strip away the leaves and we'll just pop in the flowers. It's a little bell-shaped flower and it will continue to open up and soften a bit in the design. And I absolutely want to allow this to hang out a little bit farther. So don't feel like you have to super tuck your clematis in. It's beautiful and happy to kind of float out of the vase. love to sometimes use clematis a little bit lower down in the design so it can kind of drape and spill forth. Uh, so you can play around with the placement of the clematis. And our second to last ingredient is a beautiful Veronica. This is called Clea June and it comes from Holland um, and it is almost a periwinkle color. So it's a great, I always think about how to bridge my flowers together. This is a really awesome bridge between the blue tones and the lavender tones. So it ties it together uh, really beautifully. Um, and we're gonna go ahead and nestle these guys in. I always like to kind of pocket my Veronica together um, and kind of lean them in the same direction, which is what I'm going to do. Veronica, if used incorrectly, can have a weird antenna or horn look, so we want to try to avoid that. Okay, so we're going to pocket them together. So mine are just going to kind of hang out on the left-hand side of my design, but wherever you want to put yours is just fine. Mine are right there. And then our last ingredient is one that we don't use a ton of in the shop, and I think maybe we should change that. It's very pretty. Um, it's called limonium, and this is one of those flowers that could survive like a nuclear fallout. It is totally uh, resistant to anything. You could leave it out on the table for three days and it would still look just like this. Uh, so it's super, super long lasting and sturdy, uh, and it's just a pretty airy little accent. Um, so we're going to go ahead and cut ours up into pieces, and everyone has a pretty generous amount of limonium, so don't feel like you have to use it all. Um, we're just going to kind of weave it through the design. Um, and Limonium is really beautiful in addition to kind of putting higher up in your arrangement to kind of use towards the sides and lower down. And depending on which way you orient it, you can almost angle it to drape, which I think is a really pretty finishing accent. So this is the smallest of the flowers we've used tonight. So it's the last one going in. Whenever you feel happy with the amount of ammonium, you can stop, just get rid of the rest or put it in a bud vase and enjoy it. Um, but that is pretty much it for designing. So at the end of my uh, arrangement, I always like to put eyes on it from a bunch of different angles, make sure everything looks correct, that I don't want to make any edits. Um, and it can be super helpful, especially if you're new to designing, to make sure to look at your arrangement from a few different vantage points. So uh, because I'm a pretty short designer, I like to kind of pick mine up and look at it from eye level uh, and make sure I don't have any holes or anything that looks out of sorts. Um, and then uh, there's nothing else really left to do. You wanna make sure to care for your arrangement that you give it fresh water once a day or every other day. And uh, to do that, it's very easy. There's two methods, so you can either Pick it up out of the vase with the chicken wire and then clean up your water, put fresh room temperature water in and return the flowers to the vase. Or if that terrifies you, um, you can leave it in the vase and just stick the whole arrangement under a running faucet and let the old water kind of flush out and put new water in. Um, the other thing to be mindful of is making sure that your flowers stay out of really intense sunlight. So bright sunlight will fill your flowers faster. Uh, definitely keep them in a shaded spot and away from any heat vents, and they should hold up really, really nicely. Um, if anyone has any questions about class tonight, feel free to DM us or uh, shoot us an email. We'd be happy to follow up with you. Um, otherwise, we hope you enjoy your flowers, and we will look forward to seeing you in another class soon. Thanks so much.